Bring humans face to face with their last days on Earth. Hello, I'm Elizabeth Vargas and welcome to a special expanded edition of 2020. This is a night that could change the way you see your world and yourself. We're taking you on a journey that's both breathtaking and terrifying. For thousands of years, religions great and small have been warning believers about Armageddon. Christians, Muslims, Jews all preach that the final days will be marked by chaos, violence and destruction beyond imagining. But only recently have scientists been able to come up with their own apocalyptic scenarios. Tonight, top scientists from around the world will paint riveting pictures of seven deadly threats from the least likely to the most imminent. Some are not likely to happen in our lifetime, but they could wipe out future generations. And by acting today, we could dramatically change our ability and that of our children and grandchildren to survive. When we continue, what's the most deadly force in the universe? This is light, has enough energy to completely decompose the molecules that are the stuff of life. We're talking about the end of all life as we know it. Coming up, number seven on our countdown. Scientists say in 10 billion years, our sun will die, and so therefore will we. Of course, stars die every day, and that's where we begin our countdown tonight, at number seven. Sometimes when stars perish, they unleash the most powerful force in the universe, a radioactive light brighter than a million trillion suns. Imagine if that power were unleashed upon us. Not enough people take pause and reflect on our true place in the cosmos. We like to think of ourselves as having power over our fate. No, no, not yet at least. The powers of the universe vastly exceed any powers we wield. The power of nuclear gamma radiation has long been thought of as mankind's deadliest weapon. But in the early 1970s, American scientists discovered that the power was not man's alone. While searching for evidence of Soviet nuclear testing, NASA's spy satellites began sending back readings of abnormally high radiation, far greater than any bomb the U.S. had ever seen. Scientists immediately tried to pinpoint where on the planet the blasts were originating. But to their astonishment, they found that these bursts of gamma rays were not coming from the Earth, but were coming from space. Completely unexpected. Scientists trained their satellites on the cosmos and started searching for the source of what they now call gamma ray bursts. Gamma ray bursts are fascinating, cosmic enigmas. They are the most energetic things we have ever seen or measured. These are the biggest explosions the universe has seen since the Big Bang itself. It's as massive, essentially, as an explosion can be. Gamma ray bursts occur in a few milliseconds to several hundreds of seconds, and during that time, the energy they put out is actually more energy than the whole universe in the same period of time. A gamma ray burst is uh, the, the final collapse of a star. Every piece of the star is simply falling toward the center all at once. It gets incredibly dense, it gets incredibly hot, all sorts of nuclear reactions start to happen, radiation starts spewing out all over the place. It's just a maelstrom. We see about one a day going off in some galaxy somewhere in the cosmos. These gamma rays are at safe distances. They're just cosmic curiosities in the night. But suppose a gamma ray burst happened nearby, in our own galaxy. I don't want to be around for that day. Because gamma ray bursts travel at the speed of light, towns around the globe would have no warning that a cosmic disaster was about to unfold. If a gamma ray burst bursts, It'll be the brightest thing in the night or day sky. 
won't be one sun in the sky, you'll see two suns. You'll know something bad is happening. Although the closest star to the Earth that could explode is 8,000 light years away, even at that distance, a burst headed toward Earth would be catastrophic. What it would do is it would boil off, essentially, the whole top of the Earth's atmosphere. Uh, and the consequences of that are very drastic. First thing they'll do is take out our ozone layer. Completely take out all the ozone. Once you do that, by the way, the ozone is our defenses against high energy radiation. So if that shield gets knocked out, we are bare. Without the protection of the ozone layer, everyone around you, even those hiding in their basements, would begin to get what looked like a bad sunburn from the gamma radiation as it penetrated into the Earth's crust. This is light, has enough energy to completely decompose the molecules that are the stuff of life. Temperatures would rise dramatically. People outside would be burnt by the ultraviolet radiation. Without an ozone layer, anything with eyes would eventually be blinded. We're talking about the end of all life as we know it. Within days, the radiation would begin to impact every living thing on a molecular level, stopping all cells from reproducing. Our fingernails and hair would stop growing, and worse, the cells in our intestines would stop regenerating, leaving us unable to absorb food or water. Most of the living things on the planet, plants and animals alike, uh, would not survive that kind of radiation. After one month, almost all life would be gone from the face of the Earth. However, the remnants of our civilization, the buildings, cars, street lamps, would remain intact. If any life survives a nearby explosion of a gamma ray burst, it would be the microbes that live deep under Earth's surface. There's some hope that life on Earth would continue, but bacteria will rule the world. He's been called the most brilliant mind in physics since Albert Einstein. Who better to help guide us on our journey than Stephen Hawking, who has devoted his life to discovering the secrets of the universe. Professor Hawking suffers from Lou Gehrig's disease. He cannot speak. The only way he can communicate is by blinking his eyes. And that takes a while, so we sent him our questions last week. And we can hear his answers now with the help of a computer-generated voice. Professor Hawking, first of all, thank you so much for taking the time to answer these questions. It's really been interesting to get your feedback. The universe, as you know, is a vast and powerful place with forces we're only now beginning to understand. Some of them, like gamma ray bursts that we've been exploring tonight, though extremely unlikely, are still capable of destroying our entire planet as well as us. What do these phenomena tell us about humanity's place in the universe? Events like a nearby cosmic ray burst would be devastating to life on Earth, but they haven't happened in the four and a half billion year history of the Earth so far, so the chance of them occurring in the near future is very low. The Earth is in much more danger from human action than from natural disasters. Next, a story that will really suck you in. What will your body do in response? Your body will begin to stretch. Your feet would be ripped off of your body, followed by your legs, torso, etc. You're one piece, two pieces, four pieces, eight pieces, 16, 32, 64. Not only will you not escape, light can't escape. Now we move from the brilliant light of gamma ray bursts to the heart of darkness, the second deadly force created when a star dies. It's a cosmic vacuum cleaner sucking in anything that crosses its path. Could that be us? If you look at textbooks from one and two hundred years ago, they describe the universe as being this peaceful, gentle place. We have come to learn that the universe has no shortage of ways it can kill us. One of the cosmos's deadliest threats is invisible, travels thousands of miles an hour, and devours everything in its path, a black hole. Voracious is one of the best terms to use in describing a black hole. Anything that comes within their gravitational grip 
uh, will fall in and will be consumed and turned into more black hole. You shoot a nuclear weapon right into a black hole and it wouldn't even notice. It would be smaller than a pinprick compared to the enormous gravitational pull of the black hole itself. Scientists first discovered black holes in the 1970s and since then have found tens of thousands of them scattered across the universe. Like a gamma ray burst, they're the death throes of a massive star, but with very different results. Stars, as we come to know and love them, are these balls of gas that are neither shrinking nor expanding. They're in balance. Gravity wants to make them smaller, but the heat created by fusion in the core prevents that from happening. But what happens if the nuclear fuel runs out in the center? Then the star begins to cool. And when it cools, it no longer has the ability to sustain itself against the gravity. And the gravity wins and collapses the star. When a star that was millions of miles across compresses itself down to the size of a single atom, it creates a massive gravitational pull. The gravity is so strong that no matter your speed, if you try to ascend from this zone, its gravity will pull you right back in. Not only will you not escape, light can't escape. Its gravity is that strong. Initially, scientists thought we had nothing to fear because black holes were stationary. Then in the year 2000, all hell broke loose. At that point, we had conclusive evidence that there are wandering black holes, nomads, renegades, right next to us in our own backyard of the galaxy. But luckily, so far, none of them seem to be heading our way. It would be a bad day for the solar system if we got visited by a black hole. A contest between a black hole and the Earth? Earth would just lose. It's that simple. Let's imagine that it's coming in at, say, 20 or 30 or 40 kilometers per second, about the velocity with which stars move through the Milky Way. Then it's going to take a few decades to move across the solar system. So we'd have, oh, 20, 30, maybe 100 years warning, something like that, that we had a serious problem. Within days of discovering the black hole, scientists would be able to tell us when and how we were going to die. Because the black hole would wreak havoc across the solar system, there would be no escape. It would be very much like seeing a predator come in to your village and not being able to do anything. As the black hole got closer to Earth, its gravity would begin to cause dramatic changes on the planet. The tidal effects on Earth are going to be extreme. The tides on Earth are not going to be feet high or tens of feet high, but they're going to be miles high. And so the oceans will wash over the continents. And that probably would do in most people on Earth. If there were survivors, they would be huddled on the remaining patches of high ground. The psychological effects on everyone would be pretty bad. You know that it was over, that, that basically our existence on Earth as we knew it was over. When you finally get close enough for the black hole's gravity to start dominating the gravity of the Earth, then you start hearing the sucking sound as the atmosphere is sucked off through space towards the black hole, followed by everything that isn't nailed down on the surface of the Earth. What will your body do in response? Your body will begin to stretch. Now the body's kind of elastic. You know, you can stretch a little bit. That's what you do when you, before you work out, you stretch. So it might even feel good at first. But then the difference in force of gravity will continue to grow. And there'll be a point where it will become decidedly uncomfortable for you. Your feet would be ripped off of your body, followed by your legs, torso, etc. You're one piece, two pieces, four pieces, eight pieces, 16, 32, 64, and you bifurcate your way all the way down to the singularity. I think if you gotta go, that's gotta be fun. If, if I were to pick a way to die cosmically, that would be the way to do it, for sure. If 
find me that the world We live in a world where science fiction is becoming real life all the time. When many of us were growing up, computer chips and cell phones lived only in the imaginations of writers and scientists. Now we can't imagine life without them. And that is the making of number six on our countdown of threats to civilization. Where will technology lead us? Will catering to our convenience be the death of us? Computers can, in principle, emulate human intelligence, or even better it. The result is that computers are likely to overtake humans in intelligence at some point in the next hundred years. As a species, we are number one. We're the dominant species. How is it that we've got that way? I believe it's our intellectual capabilities. So if something comes along that intellectually outperforms us, then it has the potential to take over. Man versus machine. It is a battle that's been a staple in popular culture for all of modern times. The idea sells a lot of movie tickets, but could machines really outsmart humans? To most, it sounds like a joke. My God! They've already mastered stairs! In a very real sense, they are stair masters! But some of the top scientists in the field of artificial intelligence aren't laughing. They say that massively intelligent machines could actually threaten humanity. Will it be possible for humanity to build, to create creatures, machines that are so powerful, so, so intelligent that there's a genuine risk they could wipe us out? Yes, yes, definitely. But so far, massively intelligent machines don't exist. To understand how they will become a reality, scientists say, just do the math. The electronic capacity you can put into a chip nowadays is doubling roughly every year or so. Common sense, if you take any old number and you multiply it by two, by two, by two, by two, by two, by two, you know, after a while you'll end up with a huge number, and that's, that's the case today. Sixty years ago, the world's most powerful computer weighed 30 tons. Today, a device billions of times more powerful can fit into your pocket. So at what stage could machines start becoming smart enough to be a threat, approaching human intelligence levels, and in a sense, answering back? Artificial intelligence has already given us computers smart enough to diagnose our illnesses, run our factories, invest our money, even beat us at chess. In 1997, a supercomputer named Deep Blue was able to defeat humanity's best chess player, Garry Kasparov. Kasparov, after the move C4, has resigned. I see the potential of these machines becoming not just like double human intelligence or five times or ten times, but literally trillions of trillions of times, and that's a big problem. The more advanced our technology becomes, the more control we give it. Where will it stop? What it is really is humans giving up the power, giving up the ultimate decision-making to the machine, and then in the military sense, one can see the power to do something about those decisions. The military has already developed a stable of unmanned vehicles still controlled by humans, but the eventual goal of the military is to create a technology which will give machines the power to make life or death decisions on their own. We're setting up machines to do things to humans, and not particularly pleasant things to humans in many cases. I think if they just had a small fraction of humanity in them, machines, then they're going to be awful. Open the pod bay doors, Hal. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. In 1968, director Stanley Kubrick gave us the HAL 9000, a super-intelligent computer known affectionately as Hal. I know that you and Frank were planning to disconnect me, and I'm afraid that's something I cannot allow to happen. In a high-tech version of self-defense, Hal takes charge and outsmarts and kills some of the astronauts. That's one of the major risks, that if we produce these 
godlike creatures. They may turn against us. The astronauts were able to turn HAL off, but what if a computer like HAL was connected to millions of other computers? They would virtually be in control of everything, our economy, our medical systems, our water, whatever. So if they took it into their heads to, if they had heads, whatever, into their intelligence to, to exterminate us, I don't see that being a major challenge for them. Scientists say it would be just like a scene out of the science fiction film The Terminator, only this time life would imitate art. In one hour it will initiate a massive nuclear attack on its enemy. What enemy? Us! Humans! It's like walking towards a, a sheer drop on a cliff face and saying, yeah, let's put some more intelligence into machines, everything looks all right. And in the end, we just fall off the cliff. We've given machines too much power, too much intelligence, and it's too late. Underneath Yellowstone National Park, there is a force that has the power to plunge the world into darkness. There'd be uh, men's hearts failing for fear. Sheer panic. It would be every man for himself. Coming up, the number five threat on our countdown. Number five on our countdown is a threat closer to home. In fact, don't look up, look down. Because what lies beneath could really rock your world. There's no doubt, and many people have said this before, but we, we exist on this planet purely by nature's consent. Um, if nature decides she's had enough, um, we're out. Many of the threats we face come from above. However, only one comes from beneath. What we think of as solid ground, the Earth's crust, is only 25 miles deep, and beneath that is a pressurized ocean of molten rock looking for a way out. Occasionally, it finds one. Case in point, Pompeii, on the Bay of Naples in the shadow of Mount Vesuvius. What Vesuvius tells us, and what Pompeii tells us, is that the worst thing that you could conceive from an active volcano will ultimately happen. August 24, 79 AD, it started with earthquakes. Hours later, there was a massive explosion. We use the word erupts in, in, the, in our everyday language to describe something that happened suddenly and unexpectedly. Vesuvius erupted into their lives. An entire city frozen at the moment of destruction. The people who died buried in ash, a testament to the frightening power of the blast. You've only got to look at the, the dead of the Herculaneum waterfront where the, the skeletons, uh, when they've been studied, well, you can see there are scorch marks on the inside of the skull where the gas cloud came down. It was so hot that it set the brain on fire and the, the gases then had to break out from the skull to be released. That's the power locally of something like that. And that's tiny compared to the, the most modest supervolcanic eruption. A supervolcano really is a, a volcano which generates the biggest eruptions that we know about. Now, that means something big enough, for example, to cover the entire UK or the entire state of Connecticut, I suppose, in a vast amount of debris, sort of 10 metres deep. St. Helens looked spectacular, looked devastating, um, killed around about 60 people. But in fact, a super eruption is at least a thousand times bigger than that. Unlike regular volcanoes, super volcanoes are massive canyons or calderas, hundreds of miles across, making them so big they're hard to find. Although scientists estimate there could be as many as 40 scattered around the globe, no one knows for sure. What they can tell us, however, is that sooner or later, one will erupt. The bottom line is that when one of these eruptions occurs, it's going to be a global disaster. The only, the only question is, is when and where. Rapid City, South Dakota, a peaceful town on the edge of the Great Plains, 
When authorities here think about catastrophes, they certainly don't think about volcanoes. Uh, as far as disasters go, we have uh, large forest fires, uh, blizzards, small amount of flooding on a small scale. Few here realize that just over 400 miles away under Yellowstone National Park in Wyoming, there's an underground lake of lava that has the potential to make Rapid City look like Pompeii. Yellowstone is a supervolcano. There's a giant magma chamber underneath Yellowstone. It's erupted in the past, and an eruption, we think, of Yellowstone is, is overdue. Yellowstone experiences a super eruption about once every 600,000 years. The last one was over 630,000 years ago, and when it went off, the prairie that today is Rapid City was buried under eight feet of ash. A volcano that can carry that much ash and put four, six, eight feet even of ash down upon us, I mean, that's, a, that's an event of, of, I guess, what you'd call biblical proportions, and I don't know how you would prepare for something like that. It is especially hard to prepare when scientists can't tell us exactly what the warning signs are. We haven't seen a supervolcanic eruption, so we're not sure about what we will see. But one of the things that we would expect would be increased earthquake activity, an increase in the small geyser eruptions that you get in Yellowstone. The increased seismic activity under Yellowstone would be caused by the massive lake of superheated liquid rock called magma, forcing its way toward the surface. When that would turn from uh, warning signals to there's going to be an eruption it, it is unclear. We may not, however, get much notice that the eruption's about to happen. The Bible does say that, you know, in the last days there'd be an increase of earthquakes in many places. You know, it sounds a little trite, but the Bible says when you see these things happen, look up, you know, for your redemption draws nigh. We might only get a few minutes notice that a series of eruptions were about to begin. If you can imagine the, the chambers here, these fingers of, of magma are going to reach the surface. And when they reach the surface, the eruption begins. One can imagine that there, rather than there being one spot around Yellowstone, you may get half a dozen of these, or a dozen or more, um, er erupting around the, around the, the caldera. As these erupt, they're empty in the magma chamber, and as the magma chamber gets empty, the roof of it becomes um, vulnerable. You know, there's nothing holding it up anymore, and then that collapses into the magma chamber, and then the magma chamber is open to the outside world. So all of a sudden, all this pressure is released, and that's when the whole thing um, in injects itself into the stratosphere. That's when it really goes. In Rapid City, those watching live television images from the park would suddenly see their screens go blank. These eruptions are so big that you couldn't really see them because you couldn't be close enough to the volcano and watching it and survive. You could watch it from satellite. You could see the volcano erupt. You could see the, the ash cloud begin to spread. The explosion would incinerate everything within a hundred mile radius and send a massive cloud of poisonous ash racing across the plains. It would take less than half an hour to cover all of Wyoming and cross into South Dakota. It is five hours to get across the state of South Dakota. So I'm not sure you could ever really outrun it. You would have to try to keep people inside. You know, you'd really just try to, to store up. Definitely there'd be a panic. There'd be uh, men's hearts failing for fear, you know, for what's coming on the earth. For emergency personnel in Rapid City, there'd be only one thing they could do as they watched the cloud engulf their town. Say a prayer and hope for the best. You're not going anywhere, so unless you can walk fast. Once the cloud hit, evacuation would be impossible. The drifts of ash would be over eight feet deep and heavier than snow. The ash would be so thick that it would clog all internal combustion engines, stranding rescuers. A scenario that puts us where we can't reach the people, I mean, that's, that's the ultimate nightmare for somebody in my position. The answer I don't like giving is people are going to go without our assistance. 
Almost immediately, anyone outside would be suffocated by the cloud of toxic sulfuric ash. People inside would discover that their houses provided little protection. If you're in any building which isn't very, very well constructed, then the amount of ash accumulating could cause the, the roofs to collapse and you would die uh, as a result of building collapse. Those who managed to survive would have nowhere to turn. Within a week, the ash would have immobilized the entire country. If the super eruption happens at Yellowstone, you're looking certainly at the United States beginning to fall apart. You have two-thirds of the country covered in ash. That ash is washed into the river systems. It turns to mud. It clogs the rivers. You have massive flooding right the way across the Midwest. Planes could not fly. Trucks couldn't drive. There'd be no way to deliver food to the millions whose supplies were running out. I think there'd be sheer panic. I think you'd see looting like you would in big city riots. It would be every man for himself, to be honest. It would be... Uh, dog eat dog it would be what you would expect to find in a in a, a post-apocalyptic situation within weeks temperatures would begin to plummet as the sulfuric gas created by the eruption spread all the way around the globe gradually the skies would become more and more overcast worldwide this veil of sulfur gas which would spread out across the planet would start to become very very effective at cutting out solar radiation then you would start to see temperatures falling as, as the, the, this effect of solar radiation being blocked out really began to hit home. The entire planet would be plunged into an ice age that would last for years. It would be extremely difficult to grow uh, crops and we would face something like a, a global harvest failure, global famine. If the experts are right, a year after the eruption, the only survivors would be those people who had banded together and figured out a way to grow food in this new world. We'll have to go back 200 years to where we actually cooperate and our focus will be entirely local because it's only local resources that we're going to be able to exploit with any reliability for a, maybe a generation. I can't see any situation where the human race is wiped out. There are, there are just too many of us. So we will get through it, I'm sure. Um, but I'm not quite sure what our civilization will be like when we come out the other side. When we continue... This asteroid, on Friday the 13th, April 2029, will come close enough to Earth to dip below our communication satellites. Next, number four on our countdown. If you want to think of something really humbling, consider this. 99.9% .9 of the creatures that walked the Earth before us are now extinct. Some were bigger and more powerful than we are, so why did they disappear? The answer lies in number four on our countdown. Could their fate ultimately be ours? When I look up at night and I see a quiet sky, all I can think of is there's a shooting gallery with wayward asteroids that have us in their sights. Asteroids are chunks of rock believed to be the debris left over from the birth of the planets. They can be as small as a grain of sand or as large as the state of Texas. I'm not worried about the black hole crumbling Earth. I'm not even worried about the gamma ray burst. I'm worried about the next asteroid. The average handgun fires a bullet at approximately 1,000 feet per second. The average asteroid travels more than 60 times faster. And when a large enough one of these cosmic cannonballs hits a planet, the effects are catastrophic. Look at the moon. Every night it comes out to remind us that on cosmic scales, the universe is violent. The universe can be catastrophic. There are tens of thousands of craters on the moon, and each was caused by an asteroid impact. 
Even more have collided with the Earth, but weather has softened the scars. We have a polite word for them, they're the near-Earth objects. But really, these are the things that can render us extinct. The last species to witness a giant asteroid collision didn't live to tell about it. 65 million years ago, there was a major asteroid strike just off the Yucatan Peninsula. That almost certainly was the primary cause of the extinction of the dinosaurs. One of the few species that survived that impact were tiny scavenging rodents that lived deep underground. With their main predator out of the picture, 65 million years later, those mammals evolved to take over the planet. It's this two-edged sword. The asteroid that took out the dinosaurs enabled mammals to form whole branches of the tree of life that led to us. So, do you love the asteroids or do you hate them? To keep us from going the way of the dinosaurs, a network of professional and amateur astronomers around the globe are combing the galaxy. They map and name every asteroid they find, and so far they've located more than 100,000. One was discovered recently, the end of 2004. Fine, it was a new asteroid. Who cares? Until you start plugging in the orbital parameters into your computer. You plug those in and then you watch where it goes. You can project forward where you expect to find this thing in the future. You know what we found? This asteroid, on Friday the 13th, April 2029, will come close enough to Earth to dip below our communication satellites in orbit around Earth. This asteroid called Apophis will just miss us on this go-around. However, depending on how the Earth's gravity affects its orbit, we may not be so lucky when it returns seven years later. Depending on exactly where it passes in 2029, there's a decent chance, small, but uh, a very noticeable chance, uh, one in a few thousand, that it will then strike the Earth in 2036, actually on April 13th again. If Apophis does hit the Earth in 2036, the effect would be devastating. It would create a tsunami hundreds of feet high that could race across the ocean at supersonic speeds. It's big enough to create the worst damage to life on Earth in recorded history. While the impact could wash away large parts of California, Apophis is not big enough to wipe us out completely. And luckily, odds are we'll dodge this bullet. But scientists say sooner or later, Earth will be in the sights of a much bigger asteroid, one big enough to wipe out civilization entirely. So what is humanity doing to address this deadly threat? The number of people worldwide who are working actively on this problem is enough to staff one shift at a McDonald's. And that's about accurate. If we discovered tomorrow that a huge asteroid was hurtling toward Earth, the world's attention would turn toward NASA astronauts Ed Liu and Stan Love, who've developed what experts say is perhaps the best plan to save the planet. And here's something that we have a chance to not just control, but prevent. The asteroid will miss the planet, no damage done whatsoever, if we can do this properly. Regardless of what we see at the movies, the one thing we don't want to do is blow the thing up. All that would do is transform one big asteroid into thousands of smaller ones that could cause even more damage. Instead, these NASA astronauts say that with enough advance warning and a big enough ship, they could fly millions of miles into space, rendezvous with the asteroid, and use the ship's gravity to nudge it slightly off its deadly course. The tiny gravitational pull between the asteroid and the spacecraft will be enough to pull an asteroid onto a new orbit so that 10 years later the asteroid misses the Earth rather than hitting it. That's the theory anyway, but it's still just a theory. There is no spacecraft yet, not even a blueprint. If we can put their plan into action, perhaps it will save humanity. If they fail, scientists would know decades in advance the moment of impact, leaving each of us to live with the knowledge of the exact day our world was going to come to an end. There'd probably be a lot of people who were, uh, you know, sort of, well, let's party. We don't have much time left. There'd be other people who say, well, I'm going to spend my time praying. 
Uh, there'd probably be other people who were, you know, determined to survive and, you know, would go and try to find some way to optimize their chances. Even though there'd be little chance for survival, it's difficult to imagine that humanity would go down without a fight. Regardless of our chances, some would probably try to build self-sufficient.